American government, the media. The most famous news story of all time folded at the headquarters of a major newspaper, the Washington Post. The story became known as the Watergate scandal. Watergate. And the Post reporting on it helped bring down a sitting American president. The story began when five men were caught burglarizing the Democratic National Headquarters uh, centered in the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. Watergate's the name of the building. As it happened, they had links to President Nixon's 1972 re-election campaign. Their capture sparked a flurry of news coverage, but the story quickly died down. Five months later, Richard Nixon was elected to the presidency by a landslide in 1972. At the time, the break-in of the Watergate complex seemed almost like a footnote in the campaign. It might have remained there, except for two young Washington Post journalists, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. They pursued lead after lead, revealing in one instance that Attorney General John Mitchell had a secret fund that was used to spy on Democratic Party officials. The Nixon administration charged that their ongoing reporting was biased and baseless at the Washington Post. And they pressured the Post publisher, Catherine Graham, and the Post editor, Ben Bradley, to call off the two young reporters. Graham and Bradley refused to do so. But they had their doubts. What Woodward and Bernstein were reporting was actually accurate and important. Why were no other news organizations not following up on the story? Eventually, the Post reporting convinced Congress that there was something to the story. And Congress began its own investigation that, in the end, led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon. The scandal was so captivating, two young beat reporters eventually unseating an American president, that it catapulted a new generation of young people into the field of journalism in the 1970s, and media studies, too. And it has been captured on page and in film in a story called All the President's Men. In an era of social media, nail-biting about so-called misinformation and fake news, it's worth remembering the vital role that the media have traditionally played in American life. The post-Watergate coverage illustrates the press at its best, pursuing its watchdog role. Who's watching over government? Under the First Amendment, carrying out its duty to act as a check on those with political power and to investigate when those in power engage in wrongdoing. Now, much has changed in the 21st century. The media still serves as our window into the world of politics. For most of us, politics is a second-hand experience, especially at the national level, something we learn about through the media rather than directly through participation. To assess the media's political role, we must examine the public's attention to news and information sources, what people see and hear through the media, and how the media function, their norms and their imperatives. In America's early years, newspapers were often aligned with one political party or the other. Parties were a main source of revenue, and party members were often a newspaper's principal customers. Printed one page at a time on a flatboard press, the newspaper was generally too expensive for most people to afford. Technology solved the cost problem one step at a time, beginning in the 1830s with the introduction of the rotary press. Although hand-cranked, it could print a newspaper faster and more cheaply than the old flatbed press. In the late 1800s, the steam-powered press came along, as did newsprint, those endless rolls of paper very thin that could automatically be cut and folded after printing. Newspapers could not be printed even more rapidly and much more cheaply, and their circulation increased as a result. But their allegiance to parties, or at least their partisan leaning, remained. In the 1920s and 30s, radio news, which was free to anyone with a radio set, further expanded the size of the news audience, as did TV news when it came along in the 1950s. TV news was a major breakthrough. Americans were so captivated by television that they'd watch almost anything. That was a good deal for the previous radio networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, which had the only channels available in most major media markets to start. It also turned out to be a good thing for the news in general. At the dinner hour, people didn't have a choice. National news was the programming carried by the three major networks. And people tuned in. TV news audience was huge, tens of millions of people, all receiving the same news in the world simultaneously. Newspaper readership was also very high in this period. Daily circulation in 1960 exceeded the number of U.S. households. There were more newspapers being delivered to households than there were households, meaning many people got more than one paper. Many got a morning paper and an afternoon paper. The newspaper by then had finally shed its partisan roots. Advertising was now the chief source of revenue for media, not the parties. And the larger the circulation, the more newspaper could charge its advertisers. Newspapers could make more money by reaching out to Republicans and Democrats. They would have two customers. 
and everyone bought soap, for instance, and so as they begin to moderate their coverage of political events. By law, television and radio outlets were required to treat Republican and Democratic parties equally. As a condition of their license to broadcast over public airwaves over the air, station owners were forbidden from playing favorites when it came to politics. A consequence of all this was that Americans everywhere were getting a relatively standardized, homogenized version of the national news for many decades. Most news outlets carried pretty much the same national stories and presented them in pretty much the same way. The result was what scholars describe as the information commons, a shared base of public information. Information commons, generally told with one voice, or many voices, but told very similarly. Moreover, Americans were consuming so much news, they were becoming better informed about politics and world affairs in general. Information is generally not a citizen's strong suit. Nevertheless, as research has shown, knowledge of politics and national events was on the rise in the 1960s and 70s, particularly among those less educated. Television made it easier for America's middle and even lower middle class to learn about and seek to influence America's politics. This trend did not last. Since the 1970s, Americans have become less politically informed and at times remarkably less politically informed. Polls testing the public's knowledge about major global news and events shows a clear downtrend since the Watergate scandal, interestingly. While it may seem that political opinions are tightly held and fiercely defended in the United States today, on the whole, Americans are paying far less attention to political events and are far less knowledgeable today than they were before the adoption of the internet. What developments in recent decades might account for such a downtrend in general knowledge? The explanation starts with the entry of cable television into the American home beginning in the 1970s. Few homes had cable television in 1980, but by 1990 about half had it. The number continued to rise, and it started in the 70s. Early assessments of cable TV claimed it would create an even better informed public. CNN, created by Ted Turner and based out of Atlanta, Georgia, was the first all-news cable network, and it provided 24 hours a day coverage. What could inform the citizenry better than 24-7, 365 access to international and domestic news and politics? As it turned out, another feature of cable television proved to be much more influential. Because of cable, Americans no longer had to watch the news at the dinner hour. They could choose instead to watch movies or sports or any of the other alternatives. The broadcast news audience began to shrink and it has been declining ever since, now for 50 years. The omnipresence of the news actually encouraged many Americans to look away from it and do other options. Newspaper readership also dropped steadily after cable came along. People have only so much time each day to spend consuming media and entertainment. As cable entertainment took up more and more of their time, the newspaper reading uh, trailed off. In the 1970s, about 65% of Americans read the newspaper on a daily basis. By the year 2000, the figure dropped to roughly 40%. At the turn of the 21st century, Americans had additional media options from which to choose from, including DVDs, video games, hundreds of cable and satellite television channels, and even very early forms of internet entertainment. Today, Americans spend an average of eight hours a day consuming forms of media. That's up from roughly five hours per day just a few decades ago. Yet in both relative and absolute terms, the amount of time Americans spent focused on news and politics and events has declined from earlier level, and it's fallen among all age groups. The drop-off has been particularly sharp among young adults. In the 1970s, young adults were only marginally less attentive to news than older adults. Today, they're far less attentive. In fact, compared with senior citizens, they're only about half as likely to follow the news. Young adults are more likely than older adults to get their news online. Some observers assume from this that young adults are getting as much news as older adults, or at least as much as young adults did before the advent of the internet. But the question of where people get their news is different from the question of how much news they get. Young adults spend a lot of time online, so it's not surprisingly that many of them say it's their main source of news. But that doesn't automatically mean that they're paying a lot of attention to the uh, news that's online. Research has shown that national news and politics is not a significant subject that young people explore when they're surfing the web. As with anything, news consumption is a habit. For people with the habit, the news is an indispensable part of their day. Personally, I see got news through online sources and news from my smart speaker at home probably at least 20 times a day. Every day, it's likely that I've done some combination of the following. Read a long-form article about a focused policy issue, listen to a podcast or watch a YouTube video on some major political debate, and or read a local or national periodical delivered to my house. I developed many of these habits when I was very young. I can only remember one time in my life, during a summer road trip, where I stopped paying attention to the news. It's quite free. But I am increasingly an outlier. 
Most of today's young adults don't have a news habit at all, or if they do, it's a very weak one. And that's a significant break from the past. During the broadcast era before cable, most adolescents saw a lot of television news because, like their parents, they would watch almost anything broadcast on the major networks. By the time they finished high school, many of them had developed a liking for the news. They acquired a news habit that would stick with them for their entire lives. The moment a family got connected to cable television, that tradition tended to end. With more channels vying for their attention, fewer parents were watching the news every night. Many gravitated towards sports, sitcoms, and music entertainment shows instead. And even if they were still watching the news, the children are often in another room watching something else. As you can imagine, the trends toward cord cutting and streaming media in the past decade plus have only further fragmented American news viewership. Today, the depressed level of news consumption among young adults has made them the least informed young generation in the history of American polling. Fewer than 20% of America's teenagers can readily identify the leaders of major foreign nations, for instance, and their parents don't fare much better. Changes in the news itself have also undermined the public's awareness of public affairs. The news media have a dual purpose. On the one hand, they're a civic institution protected by the First Amendment's free press guarantee and charged with informing the public. But the media are also business organizations, and big ones at that. They depend almost exclusively on advertising dollars for revenue, ad dollars and spends, which incentivizes them to attract an ever bigger audience. That imperative has always conflicted somewhat with their civic duty to report the facts. But it's been a bigger problem ever since cable TV began to siphon off their news watching audience. Much of today's news is aimed more at luring an audience than informing it. What is often called the news is actually served up increasingly as a form of entertainment, something that can hopefully compete with the major network game shows, the celebrity uh, cooking competitions, and the newest Netflix drama that pulls in the vast majority of American viewers. A study of more than 150 local TV stations and 50 media markets across the country found, for example, that crimes and accidents receive twice the coverage of local public affairs. Hook and hold is the operative strategy here. Local telecasts often open with a sensational crime or accident story, sometimes several in a row, to hook the viewers. Teasers about similar stories tend to be aired later in the newscast between commercials are used to hold the viewer on the channel. Civic affairs stories are jammed together in the middle of the newscast and given short shrift. Two in five such stories are 30 seconds or less in length. National news outlets are no different from local ones. A few exceptions, almost all major news organizations now emphasize so-called soft news, focusing on stories about celebrity relationships, shocking crimes, human drama or bravery, personal wellness, individual wealth building, or even simply weather events. In the 20th century, well over half of what major news networks and newspapers offer to consumers is focused policy and issue reporting. And Americans were ready consumers for this information. In order to coerce viewers and into an increasingly splintered media landscape, more than two-thirds of what the major news media is selling us could now be described as politically irrelevant infotainment, entertainment that informs to a small degree. Now, not all outlets have totally watered down their public affairs coverage. A study of the front page of the New York Times for over two decades found that the nature of its coverage had changed only slightly over time. Go deeper than Section A of the New York Times, however, and you'll see an increasingly uh, changed paper hyper-aware its increasingly tenuous relationship with the American public. In addition to softening the news, uh, sometimes media outlets will simply sensationalize it to try to get viewers. Even serious subjects sometimes get distorted by the, this new tendency to sensationalize. In 2014, an Ebola epidemic broke out in West Africa. When the first Ebola patient in the U.S. was diagnosed, many news outlets hyped the story. Some reports went so far as to speculate what would happen if Ebola, which is transmitted by direct contact with bodily fluids, somehow went airborne and could be contracted the same way that the flu could be uh, contracted. Ebola in the air, a nightmare that could happen. So one CNN headline proclaimed its story online, which went on to remind viewers that most people who contract Ebola die of the disease. The news coverage of Ebola scared Americans badly, even those who were hundreds of miles away from the nearest infected patient. A Pew Research Center poll conducted early in the scare found that 41% of Americans Two and five said that they were at least somewhat worried that they or a family member would be exposed to the Ebola virus. I personally remember flying through the Dallas um, Fort Worth airport two days after a nurse infected with Ebola had flown through the airport. It was all I could think about when I was in the airport, likely a result of the sensationalist media coverage at the time. I didn't even want to sit down, I remember. The takeaway is this the content of today's news, which uh, what literally earns the title being called the day's news, 
very different than what it was when your parents and especially your grandparents and great-grandparents encountered the news. Although public affairs is still the primary focus of news, it is actively competing for space with lighter fare and with sensationalized stories. In the end, what gets mouse clicks and eyeballs is what sells ads, which drives profits at the major networks and media companies. This unstated reality is important and it should guide our patterns as consumers of the news, especially when the news that is offered to us looks increasingly like clickbait. The change is part of the explanation for why the public's understanding of public affairs has declined so significantly in recent years. As a scholar Neil Postman dramatically put it, we seem intent on amusing ourselves to death. Final noteworthy change in the media system is the rise of partisan outlets. Until 1987, broadcasters were required by the government's fairness doctrine to be politically neutral. If a broadcast station carried a conservative talk show, it also had to carry a liberal talk show in the equivalent time slot. And remember, that's a product of over-the-air television using public frequencies. Less than 100 station owners found that worth doing. In 1987, the Fairness Doctrine was abolished on grounds that the availability of additional channels through cable and FM radio had resolved the scarcity problem that had justified regulating the broadcasters fortunate enough to have a license in the first place. Suddenly free to do what they wanted, station owners embraced talk radio. By the mid-1990s, there were 1,300 dedicated radio talk stations in the United States. Their cumulative weekly audience was huge, numbering in the tens of millions. One in five Americans have become a weekly listener to talk radio. The talk radio audience is largely made up of conservatives. All the top-rated talk radio shows have a conservative host. Before his passing, uh, Rush Limbaugh had a weekly audience exceeding 10 million viewers. Talk radio success convinced media tycoon Rupert Murdoch to start Fox News in 1996 as a conservative TV alternative to the network news. Within five years, Fox's audience had passed that of CNN. In turn, Fox's success inspired MSNBC to change its marketing strategy. In 2005, it switched from traditional reporting to positioning itself as the liberal alternative to Fox News. By the end of the 20th century, political bloggers were also part of the partisan media, having discovered that the most heavily trafficked websites were those that catered specifically to liberal or conservative audiences. The Drudge Report, a conservative news aggregating website that broke the Monica Lewinsky scandal during the Clinton years and MoveOn.org, which was born of liberal opposition to Bill Clinton's resulting impeachment trial, galvanized online news seekers in the late 1990s. Comedy programs entered the fray, inspired by the success of Jon Stewart's The Daily Show and others. Now, here in the third decade of the 21st century, YouTube streamers, podcasters, blue check marks on Twitter, and social media influencers are not all challenging cable news itself for viewership and connecting directly with politicians and millions and millions of viewers right on their cell phones. Echo chambers is a term used to describe partisan media. Their audiences get a version of politics that matches what they already think. Consider, for example, the difference in how Fox News and MSNBC covered the release of the Mueller report, which detailed the nearly two-year investigation into alleged Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Or consider how the two networks reported on ethics allegations made, during, uh, made against both party candidates during that same election. Both candidates had decades of political baggage to contend with during the 2016 race. Whether that baggage was ignored or became the sole focus of the candidates' media coverage demonstrates the powerful echo chamber effect of partisan media. People who watched Fox News during that election cycle latched onto Hillary's email scandal and expressed a desire to see her locked up. Meanwhile, people who watched MSNBC and other liberal media, including NPR, focused on spurious allegations of Russian collusion and supported two drawn-out impeachment uh, trials of President Trump, who was acquitted of both. Studies indicate that exposure to partisan media tends to reinforce existing partisan beliefs. Exposure also leads the audience to have less favorable opinions of the other party and to hold a somewhat distorted view of the other, other party's actual position on policy issues. Partisan outlets have helped transform America's media system. Instead of the information commons of the 70s, where citizens are exposed to more or less the same type of news. We have today a system where Americans are increasingly exposed to niche, self-selected points of view that tend to reinforce a single perspective and drown out alternative voices. This obviously complicates the public debate. Factual agreement serves as the starting point from which people can identify and settle their differences. Without agreement on the facts, the debate tends to break down almost as quickly as it starts. In the midst of policy debate in Washington that was going nowhere, 
Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who served in both the executive branch and in the U.S. Senate, blurted out, Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Today, it wouldn't be surprising for someone, even the media itself, to suggest the opposite is true. That it's the facts themselves that are up for debate. The closely held opinions are off the table. We shouldn't talk about those. I say truly, the news media world has been turned upside down in my lifetime. It's worth remembering that information is not the core ingredient of politics. Politics is largely about competing interests and the struggle of those interests to control policy decisions. That casts a different perspective on partisan media. They openly seek to promote partisan interests. Only a few decades ago, that job belonged to political parties, interest groups, and elected officials. They still have that job, but it's now also shared with the partisan media. I've made a case for how radically things have changed in my lifetime, roughly the past 40 years. But it's fair to ask, is the news media system actually any worse than the old one? Is it better to have a mix of traditional and partisan outlets than a monolithic system that everyone plugs into like we had before cable and the internet, the information commons? The answer to that question depends in part on what one thinks will actually benefit the public. The old system clearly was better at creating an informed public. This new system is clearly better at creating an engaged public. Whichever system one prefers, the new system seems here to stay. And make no mistake, it will change again. The time when a few broadcast networks and the local paper had a monopoly on the news audience is a thing of the past. Cable and the internet have brought nimble and niche media competitors into the mix. Whether you wirelessly connect to a customized, algorithm-driven video news source that appeals to your personal worldview, or still get the Sunday edition of the Wall Street Journal delivered to your mailbox, the choice is more firmly yours than it has ever been. And neither the news nor the American public will ever quite be the same as a result. 